Welcome back, everyone. I hope you took an opportunity during the break to follow COVID protocol and wash your hands. This is session seven, concurrent panel A, COVID-19, data-driven healthcare. More laws, less security and privacy. Should companies and governments be able to collect your data out of thin air? Please welcome our panel and our moderator, Dr. Alan Lowe. Remember, during the session, if you have a question, to type it into the chat box so the panel can address it after their session. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel session on data-driven healthcare. More laws, less security, and privacy. Should companies and government collect health information out of thin air? So. We have a power packed uh, collection of panelists today. And what I was hoping we would do is we'll hear from each of the panelists on this topic before we kind of go into a Q&A. And I know that we've had many challenges and uh, COVID has certainly accelerated many activities and fast tracked many decisions. However, it still seems that uh, even during a pandemic, Concerns about security and privacy still continue to crop up, and sometimes it even stops us in our tracks. So we've got a collection of folks that are even international who are going to be speaking with you and giving you their perspective as we look at this privacy and security area with data-driven healthcare. We're gonna begin with Patricia Kosim, who is the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. I won't read you her biography, which is very long. She's a very experienced uh, person with lots of background. and so so I'm going to pass it over to her to provide a little bit of a perspective from her view. Over to you, Patricia. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I'm all that experienced as much as long-winded, so I'll have to do something about that bio and cut it down. But uh, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to be here today and uh, accompanying my very distinguished co-panelists and of course all of us shepherded by you Alan um, on today's uh, agenda. I uh, wanted to start um, maybe by pushing back a little bit on the, the underlying premise or thesis of this uh, panel and I know I know you've presented it that way to be provocative as good panels uh, usually are but uh, to continue in that spirit of provocation I wanted to, um, you know, challenge the underlying assumption that more privacy laws uh, are somehow, in, you know, impeding important data flows, uh, particularly in this time of urgency and uh, and this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with that underlying premise, and, and in fact, I might op, you know, argue the opposite that uh, oftentimes clear and predictable rules uh, with appropriate and uh, pragmatic governance mechanisms in place actually facilitate data sharing, uh, while the absence of rules might make people more skittish or hesitant or reticent uh, to share information. You know, it's, it's interesting, and I'd be interested to hear you, uh, Alan, at some point comment on the panel if you're you hold that perspective, particularly uh, given your experience and your background in BC. And it's interesting, um, you know, that BC happens to be the only province without a sector specific or a health sector specific privacy law. And uh, it may be for that reason, in the absence of clear and predictable rules uh, governing the health sector in particular, that make it more uh, challenges. Hence. Um, supporting my opposite view of, uh, of your, your panel's premise. Uh, I just want to contrast the situation in BC with that in Ontario, for instance, that uh, has long had its Personal Health Information and Protection of um, uh, Protection Act, Personal Health Information Protection Act, uh, or PHIPAA, since 2004 and uh, has a number of very explicit provisions that make it possible uh, to close the knowledge gap on COVID and other public health crises. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. Uh, for instance, PHIPAA permits the disclosures of personal health information to be made for public health purposes uh, to medical officers of health and Public Health Ontario and uh, other uh, public health units. So uh, in, in turn, my office has encouraged Chief medical officers of health, public health units to provide as much 
information as uh, is necessary and possible uh, to protect public health without naming individuals. And I know that uh, it's been a, a, a subject of quite a bit of concern uh, with the public and the media wanting to know more information and uh, public health units being kind of um, nervous about releasing information that may uh, potentially identify individuals. But to the extent that uh, individuals are not identified, there's very valuable information that can be released publicly, including the number of affected individuals, demographic data, such as approximate age and gender, geographic locations of infected or, or deceased individuals, including in long-term care facilities or workplaces. And this kind of statistical information may be necessary, in fact, to uncover COVID-related risks and trends that might reveal pre-existing health inequities among populations who are more vulnerable uh, to the virus due to socioeconomic factors, you know, painting a much more complete picture of overall health and wellness. So to the extent possible, of course, we're encouraging release of this information without identifying any specific individuals. But even so, in exceptional circumstances under PHIPAA, it is possible and permissible to release even identifiable information if the custodian believes on reasonable grounds that it's uh, necessary for the purpose of eliminating or reducing significant risk of serious bodily harm um, to person or persons. So certainly the context in which we are living with a raging pandemic that is uh, in, you know, has uh, fatal consequences, you could imagine some exceptional circumstances where this exception uh, could, uh, could apply. Um, you know, there are other uh, provisions. For instance, PHIPAA allows custodians to disclose personal health information to certain prescribed entities like the Institute of uh, Clinical and Evaluative Sciences or the Canadian Institute uh, for Health Information for purposes of planning and managing the healthcare system. Subject, of course, to these organizations having their information practices reviewed and approved by my office every three years. So again, the, per the possibility is there uh, within an overarching governance framework and very clear and predictable rules. There are other rules in PHIPAA that allow health custodians to use and disclose personal health information to researchers subject to specific restrictions set out in the law, including the approval of a detailed research plan by a research ethics board. Again, the appropriate uh, governance frameworks are there. The law sets out the requirements for REV approval, including uh, the composition of research ethics boards, the uh, necessary elements that must be contained in a research plan that's presented for approval. So again, the mechanisms are there um, to govern these kinds of data flows. And in that sphere of certainty and predictability, um, as long as they're interpreted pragmatically, uh, I think these rules can really help enable the closure of some of the knowledge gaps that you were referring to. Um, our Public Sector Act, the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, also allows the sharing of personal information and personal health information within ministries. Um, these are new provisions that allow the sharing within ministries, across ministries, and even with ex external entities outside government uh, for planning government programs and services. Uh, subject to um, certain data standards that have to be approved by my office. And these data standards, you know, have to do with things like collecting, using and disclosing personal information, linking and de-identifying information, reporting publicly on the use of that personal information, securely retaining uh, personal information with minimum retention periods, securely disposing of personal information. So again, as long as there is oversight from my uh, by my office and uh, appropriate data standards are followed, this kind of sharing across what traditionally were uh, very siloed government ministries and departments is, is now increasingly possible. And I'll just give you a last example. In July 2020, a special amendment to the regulation under PHIPAA was made to allow uh, the Institute of Clinical and Evaluative Sciences and a new large super agency, Ontario Health, 
to disclose personal health information to the Ministry of Health if the disclosure is necessary precisely for the purposes of researching um, and alleviating COVID-19 or its effects and evaluating or monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on the management and allocation of resources in the planning system and the health system. Um, so this, this platform uh, is called the Ontario Health Data Platform. Uh, will not be made available to the general public, but it will be governed within the Ministry of Health uh, to make that information available to researchers uh, to and to facilitate access to that information uh, for research purposes under uh, a screening and approval process. So all this to say, I hope I've convinced you that where rules do exist and appropriate governance mechanisms are placed, they can enable responsible data sharing as long as um, you, you need not only the rules, but you also need a very pragmatic, practical interpretation and application of those rules. And I think that's the uh, secret uh, ingredients in the sauce that um, might very well disprove your overarching thesis, at least in Ontario. So uh, that, that's it for now. I know you'll have questions later, but uh, over to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for that very enlightening summary and uh, hearing your perspective that actually from a practical sense that there is sharing of data is just wonderful to hear. I'm a practicing pharmacist and also an academic, and it is great to hear that there is facilities that's going to facilitate research in this area. Um, Unfortunately, in BC, we don't have a P HIPAA and not that kind of control. But we'll talk more about that as we get into the discussion. Um, we're going to go into our next uh, brief presentation now as well um, from Robin Goldsoil. She is the president of RGS Management Consulting Services, also the CPO of Pentavir. So welcome, Robin. Please share your perspective. Thank you. Um, and I also want to thank you for inviting me to this panel and to be sitting next to such prestige and very uh, qualified individuals to talk about this um, particular topic um, i would say alan i also found the title very um it charged me i would say in possibly uh, not always the positive ways because i'm I don't believe we need more laws I would, uh, in order or less laws. I think the issue is less about the laws and it's really about understanding the laws, understanding the culture that we want to portray, have the right attitudes in, in governance all about it. And as a person who's worked within this industry and having to share a lot of medical information um, in part of my roles, I would have to say there was a lot of myths and I think Pat did a great job at um, busting some of those or demystifying some of those myths about the ability to share um, within the healthcare sector. Um, I think we're very used to in the traditional um, pillars of talking about healthcare that there are very good cases of sharing data, but you just need to understand it and how to operationalize it within that current environment. But a few things I think have changed um, that really came to the forefront. We kind of knew that some time ago already um, in the industry. And that is, especially from PHIPAA, that was very Ontario-based, it was very supportive of the healthcare models that existed for some time, and that no longer is the case. Uh, I have to say the laws are, um, the business models, but who holds the data and how the data gets modeled and how they all help out is very, very different today um, than it was when PHIPAA was actually evolved. And what that did is it's created some new tensions um, that goes to, you know, can we share data with organizations that aren't necessarily governed under PHIPAA? And I think from my experiences, that's also doable when when it's done right and uh, i think there's a recognition that we need to have the data and i think there's another panelist pam will be telling us a really good news story about how that's all come to fruition so i i would say publicly as a person even who's living through the pandemic i want to see the sharing of the data but i want to see it done responsibly and i want to trust the people who have it that i know the information will be used only for those particular purposes um, so I would say there's probably a change in attitudes of consumers, but they're voicing about where they want to have those protections today and what they think is a, 
is appropriate sharing um, overall. And I think everything that we've done in the commercialization, I would say, is is kind of really important. And it's important to understand how the pillars now are interfacing. Um, so what I'm going to do is say, like, when we're going through it is I want to kind of shift our emphasis and our focus is it's not about we can't do it. It's about how do we do it and how do we get the recognitions that we get the benefits of data sharing along with those governance models and the controls that Patricia already did a really great job at um, talking about. Uh, one thing I think the way you start about doing that is through a very pragmatic approach, right? And I think before you go looking at the data, you have to start with the business problem. Do we need to understand the analytics of what we're trying to do? So what problem are we trying to solve? And then where is the data we need in order to get that? analytics um, and is it even achievable i can tell you with one of our clients it's not so much about sharing the data it's about getting access to the right data to make the decisions and so much of our data in the healthcare environment is still written in clinical notes and it's unstructured and that is important information about how we live our lives that will help them to answering the problem so we need to get better access to that data um, and there's tools out there now that can do that before we even begin to sharing it. Um, I would say the other thing we need to do is be very careful about knowing the data is reliable and knowing it's coming from good sources. So in Ontario, we have a very controlled pattern of how that data is supposed to be shared, but there's some of it that isn't there that we need that would help solve the problem. So we have to do that with a good quality and have the right governance around making sure the data is cleansed. We understand the taxonomy, we understand the quality, and we know that the right people are using it in the right decisions. And once you get all of that piece done, you can start thinking, in my opinion, about really what the privacy and the security considerations would be in terms of bringing minimization and de-identification uh, to the solution, right? And are we protecting it and moving it in the right way with the right contractual relationships? To me, that is already well understood and the easy part. It's about getting really good quality data that will be helpful for the decision that we're trying to solve with accuracy and credibility. And then finally, the thing I'd like to deal, like talk about is Pat mentioned about the inequities um, that is, is possibly that we could overcome by sharing the data. We just really need to make sure we're looking at it from the right consideration and making sure that we look at the issues of diversity and inclusion and fairness in terms of those populations and what some of those outcomes would be as we're trying to share it. Um, those are some of the key issues that I have. And if we do that, everybody will have trust, I would say, overall in the system and allowing us to share the information. Thank you, Robin. That is an excellent uh pragmatic approach and I really like how you've taken a kind of grassroots pragmatic approach and how we'll actually collect and deal with this data. Um, very nice that you also pointed out that it's got to be good quality data and it sounds like nowadays we are getting some quality data coming out. Using it still has some challenges and we're hearing some of that here. Um, not as much in Ontario now that there is the PHIPAA in place. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Wendy Hurlbert, who's the president and CEO of Life Sciences BC. And I think she may have uh, also another view. And, you know, the title was meant there to be provocative and it was to challenge folks and also incite a debate because that's where everybody gets riled up, energetic. And, you know, not that we want you to fight, but a good debate's always good because that's when we hear all sides and we can hear the arguments. So I'd like to pass it over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Alan, and um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. And as my previous panelists have said, uh, it's an honor to be here with such esteemed colleagues. So um, I'm not in a position to talk as much about the laws. I would never, <laughs> I would never claim to know anything more than than Pat on that. But um, I do think um, one of the things that often happens is as Pat talked about, there are a lot of laws, rules, governance that are in place today. Many of them are effective. Many of them are extremely outdated, um, which I think um, everybody in this profession recognizes. And so it's challenging sometimes to rely on the laws and the rules when they're so outdated and the practices are so different. 
it does rely on good governance and it does rely on expertise and knowledge and leadership. And one of the things that I think often happens is those laws, rules and governance are not well understood. And as a result, people tend to get very frustrated when they're working with our profession, that being prof uh, privacy professionals, because it always seems like the answer starts with no. No, you can't do that. Why? Because of privacy and security. Well, help me understand that. And often that's where people get lost because of the fact that in many cases, those people that are being put in the situation of answering those questions aren't necessarily one, dealing with laws and rules that are current, or two, have sometimes the level of expertise that they need to understand the problem, which is where Robin was coming from. What problem are we trying to solve? Because there may be different ways that we can solve the problems we're trying to solve. I look at data as an asset. I've been passionate about privacy. I've worked in the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, and I really truly believe that people need to have their, their personal information protected. Yet I also believe that I'm okay with people using my data to make better decisions, provide better services, invest in better things, certainly as it relates to health, will provide me with better healthcare. And we live in a world where our data is extraordinarily fragmented and any, many of the initiatives that are put in place to try and bring that data together to make it less fragmented are always brought up with a barrier of privacy and security. So with the entire profession and everybody working together, I think we can solve those problems. There are so many opportunities out there as it relates to what we can do with data, whether it be cost reduction, um, and wastage within our healthcare system. There are reports that would suggest that anywhere from 30 to 60% of what we spend in our healthcare system is currently wastage. Now, data consolidation and leveraging data is not going to solve the entire wastage problem, but I can tell you many professionals in the system will tell you it will certainly help contribute. The other is as it relates to preventative and predictive medicine and predictive conditions. Imagine if we were able to utilize our data, and in many jurisdictions, people do do this under certain conditions, to be able to really help people understand what may be something that they're facing in the future with a degree of certainty that is data-driven. That would be fantastic. As well, we've talked about research at other seminars and the importance of using health data in research. And we really want to think about in the power of AI and quantum computing, how we can actually use our data to drive optimized treatment outcomes. And Alan, I know based off of your experience as a pharmacist, you see this every day. And so I really encourage, I'm not here to debate whether more laws, less laws. I am, I am recognizing there are a lot of laws. In many cases, they're not understood very well and they are outdated. And I think we need to collaborate and work together to try and make sure that we do created a governance, a robust governance environment that protects people's personal data, but also allows us to utilize this asset that we have in data to drive better patient outcomes in our healthcare system. Thanks, Wendy. And that I think uh, is also a very important aspect that it's this outdated laws that we're still trying to comply with. And maybe that's why everybody's throwing up those excuses. They may not be valid excuses that are being brought forward, but it is why we're told we can't make a change. And as you had mentioned, being a pharmacist, we're still using the fax machine. And when I ask the colleges and the regulatory bodies as to why that's the case, oftentimes it's privacy and security that's cited without any real further explanation. So certainly we need to dive deeper into that, whether we need an updating of the laws or whether it's just interpretation so that we can challenge some of that to move forward, I think is where we need to go. I'm gonna bring it over to Stephen Bretham, who's the Director of Sales Enablement at Bronis. And he's coming from Minnesota, so he can give us some examples of maybe some of the successes he's seen and potentially even look internationally to see what he's come across to maybe help us out from a different perspective. Over to you, Stephen. I'm just going to say I probably have the uh, closest to a Canadian accent of anyone over in the United States. So I guess uh, uh, getting somebody from Minnesota is proper for this panel. I, I also want to echo what everyone else said about 
uh, how uh, prestigious this group is and how honored I feel to be here to participate. I'm going to take this from a little bit different perspective, I think, than some of the other folks um, coming from, you know, the uh, the private side of the house in an organization uh, in particular, the company that I work for, which is a, a data security platform that uh, does analysis, identification of sensitive content, including PII, health-related records, as well as monitoring and making sure that those information stays protected. So. Um, what can I provide here as a U.S. citizen that's different? Well, even though there's definitely some differences between the way the two uh, health sectors are run, depending on if you're in the United States or if you're in Canada, depending on which province you might be in Canada, um, I see a lot of similarities or we see a lot of similarities in my organization between what we see with uh, the United States and their HIPAA-related uh, or PAPITA or PHIPAA or any one of the uh, province-related uh, you know, data privacy, data security type of items, there tends to be a lot of similarities in there. And what we've seen in our organization is that um, we see, uh, like Alan just mentioned before, you know, we still see, you know, companies using EMRs or sophisticated systems to track this health data and try to keep it protected and do sophisticated sharing, as some of my predecessors have talked about or some of the farmer folks have talked about. But we also see a lot of it in faxes and, and in emails and in files and in, in SharePoint and, and, and Microsoft Office 365 and different sort of elements like that, particularly as we have shifted towards a pandemic where more and more people are working remotely. Um, one of the things that my organization does is we do an annual risk report. And while we didn't do one in 2020 for kind of obvious reasons why 2020 was a little different, uh, I wanted to share some of the numbers that we got uh, from previous years. Uh, in in uh, 2019, we looked at uh, over 50 petabyte of information across 785 organizations. A lot of these were healthcare. We, we do a lot of um, a lot of our customers are in the healthcare industry, and what we we're finding over and over again is we're seeing a lot of um, lack of visibility into what they have in their organization. Uh, 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 Robin mentioned before, unstructured data, not really knowing what that data is, not having a good identification of it. Some of the statistics, 15% of companies found had over a million files exposed to every single employee in the organization. Uh, some organizations that we worked with had, uh, and an on average organizations we dealt with had 17% of their data with any person in the company uh, being able to get access to that, which is obviously ripe for uh, issues and problems with that. And over half of the data that we looked at across these organizations uh, was what we would consider stale, meaning that it hadn't been touched in, in over a year. Um, and the risks of this in the health organization, obviously, is uh, you know not only they don't have the, the, any idea of this problem at, at scale, but also one of the things that a lot of these regulations, uh, a lot of these different regulation acts is requiring you to respond if there is a data breach, if there is a leakage, if there is information uh, about these uh, individuals, medical information about these individuals that does get breached, you have a duty to report that. And we see that a lot of times organizations aren't um, able to do that. Um, I mean, just to state from my own personal perspective, I think there's nothing more important right now uh, in the middle of a pandemic um, that we need to be able to share this type of information, uh, information such as, uh, you know, discussing things like immunizations. Are we, you know, in the United States, we're talking about are we going to require people to be immunized to go back to work, to go back to traveling? Um, you know, do we need to know who people are who have the conditions that make them more susceptible to serious cases of COVID so they can be the first ones to receive those vaccinations? All of this type of information sharing is absolutely critical. Um, but what we've seen from our perspective in our organization is we need to make sure that these um, regulations, be, there, be them old or new, if they're being replaced, do have some teeth in place, that they do put in some efforts to protect the consumer if they are providing their information um, uh, through these, uh, you know, through a web system or through email or submission or anything like that, that there is some recourse if something does happen and this information is attacked. We've seen various uh, attacks. I mean, obviously, recently the solar winds uh, breach, which has been you know widespread across the entire world, where we had all these different organizations uh, compromised and many more that we just don't know about yet. Uh, so we need to make sure that we keep those people protected as best we can while sharing that data. Well, thanks, Stephen, and uh, thanks for kind of bringing a U.S. perspective to it. Certainly, we can learn from our southern counterparts as you're a little bit further ahead in some ways, and we're still developing new legislation that's coming in place in different provinces. So thanks for that.
I'm going to pass it over now to Pam Snively, who is Chief Data and Trust Officer at TELUS. And I'm sure she's going to have some examples for us to really kind of sink our teeth into to illustrate how our current laws may be sufficient and still allow us to progress and develop uh, applications and innovation. So over to you, Pam. Thanks very much, Alan, um, and uh, hello, everyone. Really nice to be here today and, and uh, echo echo the others' thoughts. It's always a pleasure to be um, alongside such uh, such great minds in the in the privacy industry. Um, <clears throat> Going to talk a little bit about our Telus Data for Good program today because I think it, it's actually um, really illustrative of. Uh, a lot of the issues that we've talked about today and that have been raised by the other speakers. Uh, in the context of the, the Data for Good program, what we do is we provide um, access to academics, health researchers, our government, um, to our database, uh, to a data platform, so that they can do research on COVID-19 and flattening the curve. And what, what you know, the supervised guided uh, access to the data. So what is the data? The data is our actually our TELUS, telco mobility data that we have de-identified. Uh, so before I go any further, I just want to say what we had done prior to March of last year when all of this hit was we had spent about uh, almost three years working on a de-identification platform where we could take this mobility data and we could de-identify it in order to do analytics in de-identified form. Uh, it had been, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of work, um, and probably in many ways more work than uh, should be necessary. In part because, uh, as Pat says, when the laws are clear, it's great. Um, uh, but you know, when it comes to de-identification, there isn't a lot of clarity, and so we wanted to be absolutely certain that what we were doing was going to be acceptable, both legally, but also even more importantly, acceptable to our customers. Uh, so we went through a, a pretty long, arduous process, working with a number of um, leading thinkers in the de-identification space, and, and probably went with a, a bit of a, a belt and suspenders approach, um, using uh, two of the leading technologies in order to uh, in order to be sure that it was truly de-identified in, in, a, in a strong fashion. So we had this, and we were designing it originally as a, as a, as a business, um, and we included an opt-out, and we designed it uh, with you know all of the great privacy controls that one would hope for, and we obtained privacy by design certification. So here we were with this 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 platform, and then COVID nineteen hit, and we quickly realized uh, within within the month of March that the data here could be incredibly useful to health authorities, governments. Uh, and academic research who are working uh, to try to figure out what we could do about COVID-19. But our, I, I have to be honest, our first response, we realized very quickly this would be very valuable, but our first response was um, one of fear, that it would be too risky to use this data and to go out and publicly make this data available because it could be misinterpreted. So we weren't worried that we weren't complying with the law. We were worried about public attitudes and perceptions, and, and, and Robin talked a little bit about that. Um, and how could we make sure that our customers would be comfortable with what we were doing and why we were doing it, <clears throat> and, and, and indeed comfortable that their privacy was being protected? You know, I just said we spent three years working with experts on this. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to explain. Uh, so we first, had, you know, we had one meeting about this internally, and our first decision was, to forego the opportunity. And I have to tell you, I was heartbroken because for me, the whole reason uh, for all the work that we had put in in previous three years was for just this very type of application, um, you know, this data for social good. Uh, and Wendy talked about using data for better health outcomes. Uh, this was the very definition of that. And I thought, if we're going to all of this trouble in order to be able to say yes, and yet we're saying no, uh, we're doing something very wrong. So, uh, you know, I had one heartbroken, heartbroken night um, and then went back to the drawing board and said, okay, how can, how can we do this in a way that will make our customers comfortable? Because I, I know the solution is good. How do we convince them? Um, and started to map out, okay, well, let's be really transparent. Let's 
talk about what we're doing with the data, what we're not doing with the data. Let's address head on what people's fears might be. And a lot of those had been expressed in the meeting the day before. People were saying, well, they'll interpret it that we're selling their data. They'll interpret it that um, we're spying on them. So how can we address those considerations? They'll think we're reporting them to the police for gathering in groups bigger than five, that kind of thing. So we thought, let's just, let's just address that um, head on. So we went through, you know, what really in some ways is a bit of a microcosm of what happens in the health sector when we're talking about using data. This wasn't technically health data, but it was data, personal data, location data, um, that was being used for, for health benefits and, and similar to health data being used for social good. Uh, but we had all these, these very barriers, so uh, the very same barriers. So the, the fear, the technology, uh, you know, Robin talked about the the, the data. We, we'd long since identified, you know, what data, and we'd gone through that process, making sure we had clean, good data, um, and that had been done previously. So then, we went through the process of posting this on our website. We thought, what we don't want, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm being absolutely transparent here. You know, a real consideration is. How will the media interpret this? Because at the time, there was a lot of discussion about what was going to happen and that, you know, in the course of the pandemic, we were all going to see our, our privacy go out the window. So we knew we had a very sensitized Canadian population, and rightly so. I think it's really important for us to be vigilant during times like this. Uh, and we were concerned that if, if it gets misinterpreted, it's really hard to come back from that misinterpretation and, and not sound defensive. And, um, and for us to put forward that we had been thinking about this from the very get-go, in fact, before this even happened, we had been focused on protecting privacy. So we had to think about how this was going to play out in the media. We had to talk, in some cases, to the media outlets. We went, of course, and, and let uh, the privacy regulators know. Uh, again, there's clarity in the law um, to some degree, and, but, uh, you know, and, and um, Patricia talked about the clarity in Ontario. But even when there's clarity on Ontario, there is not clarity when you're talking about data going across jurisdictions. We didn't really have to deal with that issue as much, but we still felt that it was important for us to go to every every uh, regulator and, and give them a heads up about what was going to happen, um, so that there there wouldn't be um, well, every, every regulator that would touch on our business, uh, so that they wouldn't be blindsided, that they would understand what was happening and they would feel comfortable um, with with what was going on and the controls that we had put in place. But so we went through this exercise. Um, ultimately, we're able to uh, share the data, and it's been uh, very gratifying for, for us to see that this data has been used for really fantastic purposes and has been able to really influence um, public policy, uh, health policy, uh, and we can see what's working and what's not working in some of our, uh, when some of our policy decisions are implemented. Well, thanks, Pam. That's excellent that, uh, you know, TELUS is such a good corporate citizen and that they can dive into this and start to figure out how best to de-identify and to see if that de-identification process is appropriate. And particularly when there aren't specific laws and regulations written about it, it does require, I guess, the individual players to take that added step and to go that extra mile to make sure, speak with the different regulators to get uh, an idea of how best to do it. So I think that this kind of sets a very nice standard to extrapolate from. And, you know, one of the first questions that I'm going to have for you is actually, you know, how did you ensure that the level of de-identification was sufficient, but at the same time, it still allowed you to get things done? Because sometimes you work so hard in making sure everything is stripped out that what you're left with isn't really analyzable, and then your data analytics uh, can't be really carried out. So can you maybe share with the audience what you went through and how you can balance that? Yeah, it, it was a long process. Um, we were lucky uh, in this particular project, but we're looking at other opportunities to leverage other uh, types of data, and it gets trickier depending on what you're trying to do. And I and I fully acknowledge that in many areas of, of healthcare, we need a fair amount of identification, identifiability in the data to get what we really want to get to. But um, uh, in our case, we were looking at mobility data and large patterns of how people are moving was what we were after. We really didn't need a lot of identifiability in it. Uh, but there, but location data is inherently challenging to de-identify, and there had been a lot of studies, um, you know, actually saying it was impossible. Uh, so we went and worked with some of the people that had done the study saying it was impossible and said, okay, help us make the impossible possible. Um, and we got there. So. It, uh, well, we didn't have that identifiability, um, the, you know, that kind of 
um, challenge with the utility and, and de-identification. We just had a really big de-identification challenge that we had to overcome. Um, one thing I, I just wanted to add on, you know, we talked a little bit before about sort of you know, people throwing privacy and security up as, as a barrier. Um, and I and I do think sometimes it's, um, you know, a, a lack of awareness of the laws, as, as has been stated, um, and, and a lack of clarity. And I really, you know, I, I really agree with Patricia that like, clarity is, is helpful. Um, one of the things that we didn't anticipate that, that did materialize was when we went to these different levels of government, um, they were all really excited initially, and then the brakes would get slammed on, where they'd suddenly be afraid of how this might play out. Like, they were worried about the privacy implications and whether this would reflect back on them for using this data. Uh, so then they had to go through their own analysis. So there, you know, these these are real, uh, real fears that people have about um, consumer trust, citizen trust, um, and patient trust. And we we all have to go through a lot of hoops to make sure that we can be comfortable that uh, we're not going to be endangering that trust and, and, and risking it. Thanks. And actually, with that mention, I do want to bring it back over to Patricia. And, you know, with all these new technologies that are coming into place and certainly being accelerated by COVID, lots of public health attention being drawn to health data in general. You know, we've got tracking apps that are popularized out there. And, you know, this pandemic is going to lead to a fundamental change, I think, in our conception of health privacy, because now we're looking at people's personal health data that has an impact on those around you and you know those even around the world because people still continue to travel because traveling uh, for necessary purposes are still happening and you know it seems like it's less about keeping information private and it's more about controlling how it's used and this is where i want to maybe pass a question over to patricia and saying how can we control how it's used without, I guess, over stifling or creating too many laws? And would you have some suggestions for other provinces that don't have a PHIPA or something like that to help control that data flow and data use? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that question. And, and, and thank you to all the panelists for those uh, great remarks. There's so much we can dive into. Um, just to s uh, start off on your, on your question around control, uh, it, it's a point actually I was hoping to make because privacy is about control. It, privacy is not about holding back the data. It's about having that sense of control that you can do with it uh, what, uh, what you wish. And you can share it with whom you wish. And in some circumstances, um, those decisions are made uh for you um, or on uh, on exceptional um, bases because of broader societal considerations. But at its core, privacy is about that sense of individual control. Um, you know, I, I really agree with, with Wendy when uh, she she mentioned, particularly in the health context, in the health or in the research context, many individuals, uh, many people want to share their uh, data for for research purposes. And I think it's very, very important to enable that to happen. Um, and I hearken back to my days at the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, at Genome Canada. I mean, time and time again, uh, you know, we have to be really careful to help enable the wish of individuals to uh, contribute to research and have a meaningful role in advancing knowledge about um, conditions and diseases they, they cared about, uh, afflicting their families and, and really wanting to do their part uh, to contribute to society. So I think uh, control in many ways is synonymous with privacy. It's not the antithesis. It's uh, it's all about control. And you know, um, one thing you said uh, you asked about models. Uh, what this panel has raised is, uh, I think, a couple of gaps in the regulatory regimes in Canada, certainly, and two have been mentioned. Robin talked about commercialization, and I absolutely agree that. While there are regimes in place that enable um, research and public health purposes of data, particularly in the public sector, in the health sector, we haven't quite uh, figured out yet how to enable data across sectors, particularly between and 
you know, the health and commercial sectors. And there are, um, there are examples of, of that is starting to emerge. Uh, rules in PHIPA that have not yet been adopted around consumer electronic service providers that allow rules for commercial actors in the, um, in, in the health system. Uh, the federal bill C-11 talks about uh, private sector organizations being able to share information for or data for good. Uh, TELUS being a prime example under certain conditions, so we'll see what uh, what the fate of that federal bill is. But I do think that that's where um, the next challenge will be is in enabling that cross-sectoral uh, sharing of information. And, and I couldn't agree with, uh, with you more around uh, the need to clarify the concept of de-identification. Again, PHIPA introduced uh, you know, a provision that would allow for the term to be identified, to be defined in regulation that we're still waiting for. Uh, and uh, the federal bill, D11, also tries its hand at uh, dealing with de-identification. Uh, I don't think it's quite there, uh, but I think that's a really big challenge that uh, could certainly use some greater clarity. Thanks for that, Patricia. I'm going to actually ask uh, Wendy and probably go to Stephen and Robin as well. So maybe expand on that uh, bit about commercialization. Certainly, I know in Wendy's organization, she does support a lot of the research, development, and innovation that uh, happens in BC. And she did speak about collaboration around groups getting together, that we do have to have a more robust governance around this area. And actually, I'll just ask you, Wendy, what do you think um, will help commercialization, innovation, and research? Um, well, I think um, many of the panelists have talked about this, and I, um, I really, you know, agree with a lot of what Patricia is saying. Um, you know, around the modernization of laws, around the clarity of laws. Um, I tend to sit back on this data issue in in healthcare, and um, based off of my experience, where I was the privacy officer of a diabetes insulin pump business, we had probably every last amount of sensitive data a person can possibly have. We needed their medical information, um, in many cases needed to prove medical necessity for products, which meant that we had an extraordinary amount of their background. Um, and in addition, we needed all of their financial information and their private health insurance. So it pretty well didn't get more sensitive than that in, in many cases, and arguably dealing with cross-sector. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting as I think of how we manage health data, and if we reframe our relationship with the health system and think of ourselves as a customer of the health system, and I'm a customer of a bank, and firstly, I would never debate with my bank as to who owns my data. You know, I clearly own my data, and I expect my bank to use that data to protect that data, their custodian of it. But I also want my bank to use that data to provide me with the best possible services, um, to understand where I can make better financial decisions. And I don't want them to waste my time by me needing to give them the same data over and over and over again. I expect them to have my data in consolidated manner. Sorry, you just cut out there a little bit at the end there, Wendy. So, uh, thanks. Did you have more to add? Um, no, that that's that's so that's okay. Okay, and that, actually, as you're speaking about how consumers are potentially comfortable with that sharing of data, because of course we don't want to duplicate our work. We already have gone in, we've given our data and all our demographics to one person. It's just awful when you asked over and over again. And certainly we're still doing that in healthcare. You'll see your doctor, you will have to provide all of your patient history and background. You might see your pharmacist, they're gonna ask you the same questions again. And if you head over to your nurse, again, another healthcare practitioner is also gonna ask you these things over and over because we're still having trouble with some of that sharing. And I know Robin has a perspective that, you know, some consumers are now getting a little bit more comfortable with that. Can you expand on that, Robin? Um, thank you uh, for passing that question. What, to me, I would say consumers today are sharing so much medical data 
among their apps. There's an app that takes your heart rate, that takes your monitor, that has your blood sugar, uh, that deals your Fit app, your exercise app, um, my glute coat. Like I, there's an app for everything, and I kind of almost sometimes manage my day to day living in medical by, through so many different apps. But what I can do as a consumer is it goes back to the trust of the company. I wouldn't use the app from certain companies. And as an individual, I kind of look to see who I'm dealing with before I start handing over some of that app. And I actually read a little bit about that company before I actually start using them. So I think it goes back to some of the earlier pieces. We really need to have trust in our companies. And if we trust our companies, we'd be willing to share the information with them in order to use it for maybe even some other purposes. I mean, that's why we see Apple now promoting privacy as part of their device and changing their development standards, right? They want to be seen as that, you know, technology company that is supportive of, of giving you that balance to control and what's happening with your data. They even had an arm at one time where you could sign up a research, by right? Whatever data they collected from you, you had choices of who they shared it with and they would give you back information on that. So when you start getting those type of basic uh, principles applied within the company and the trust, you'll even, it won't be a conversation to have, I think about whether or not we should share. It'll just happen naturally. Yes, and I'm gonna be asking Stephen about his perspective on that uh, coming from the US and certainly we're gonna perceive the US as being very commercialized and uh, pushing that capitalism side, but at the same time doing it properly. And certainly agree with you, Robin, that you know the company that you're working with really does matter. The more reputable, the more respected they are, the you know more likely that you just trust them with your data. And you know who reads the uh, end user licensing agreements? You know that EULA that pops up every time you download or access anything. It's pages and pages. And I got to say, privacy is probably one of the bigger sections and one that's upfront and personal because they always tell you about the use of your private information. And yet, I'm sure all of us just kind of skip it and we kind of power through. But most of the time, it's the trust in the company. So having a reputable company and, you know, as Pam was saying and how carefully TELUS did it, you kind of have one chance because if you do it wrong, it's hard to recover. So I wonder from your perspective, Stephen, can you talk about how commercialization and use of this data has been used successfully and any tips for the audience? Sure. Well, I think I read somewhere once that if uh, you read every EULA, the average amount of websites and sites that people go to, that you'd be reading EULAs for 18 hours out of 24 of the day. So it's probably not quite possible for you to do that. Uh, I mean, it is, it is really interesting. Um, and, and, and different companies, I mean, in the U.S., different companies have different levels of maturity. I mean, there are, um, there are uh, like the medical company that I get my insurance through, which I know is kind of weird. I get it from a private company for, for you all. Um, they're a very, very large company. And so they provide medical, vis uh, vision, dental, pharmaceutical. So I get everything from one place. So I am lucky enough that they're sophisticated enough and they're a big enough company that when I go to them, Everything's, it's kind of one-stop shop. All of my information, all of my claims, everything's in one site, which does fill me with hope, which means that, you know, obviously we can do this. We can expand and, and share information, probably not only between medical, but, but other things as well. Um, but at the same time, I mean, one of the things that I think makes me a little bit more comfortable, at least with, with medical, um, because of our HIPAA regulations here in the States, is the fact that we have seen major repercussions for companies that are not taking the proper steps to uh, protect this information. I mean, Anthem was one of the largest of all, of all time, and it took several years for that litigation to go through, but it ended up being a very, very sizable chunk. And we're still seeing it. <clears throat> you know, we're seeing issues where if you're not doing due diligence with ransomware or, you know, uh, insider, malicious insider, outside or those types of attacks, that if you do get those types of issues, um, you will have to, there will be fines, there will be uh, issues with that. Um, but I, I, I echo the same as, as what was said before. I'm very careful about, you know, which information I go to some companies I trust, like I wear a Fitbit on my arm, I, I, tr I trust that they're going to be okay with my information. There's other companies that I don't. And uh, I don't, know if I'd feel more or less comfortable, you know, either side of uh, North America that we're on, regardless of that. So. Thanks, Stephen. I'm going to 
take it to uh, Patricia to get her perspective on what she thinks about people being very trusting. I mean, part of the reason why we have all the laws and legislation in place is to try to safeguard our public against any wrongdoings and things that go against them. But here we are, uh, a population being very trusting on many of the things that we're getting into and whether we require that legislation. So maybe I'll just pose it to you, Patricia. In BC, we're still lacking some of that data, or sorry, some of the privacy laws and a PHIPAA. And uh, in some ways we want to focus it on controlling and we've got outdated legislation in place. What would you recommend for BC? Do we need more laws? Do we need more controls to be spelled out and written? Or what insights would you provide to other provinces uh, uh, with respect to developing new regulations and more regulations? Uh, sorry about that. I, I hesitate to venture an opinion on other jurisdictions laws so I'm careful not to do that and I, I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate that so um, but let me just answer your question more generally uh, I, I think um, you know there's a uh, there's probably if I can use the analogy or the metaphor of a sandbox I think people um, who are more and more tolerant and understanding that to play in the sandbox access to these apps, to have access to these technologies, these services, the research, the knowledge, you know, there is a certain amount of fair play in the sandbox that, uh, you know, uh, individuals uh, need to address or need to decide for themselves whether they want to uh, play and contribute. But I think what um, is very important for promoting that uh, that consumer trust or that citizen trust is to be very clear on the edges of that sandbox and to have really strict rules, penalties for players that play outside uh, the, the sandbox in, in foul play. And I think that goes a long way to uh, engendering public trust, consumer trust, citizen trust. And, you know, that doesn't mean that all the good uses and all the responsible uses can proceed within, you know, appropriate responsible governance frameworks and, and conditions. But it just means that when you go outside, you know, color outside the lines, uh, there should be um, strong penalties uh, to, to punish the bad players and to make it even and fair for all the players that are, are playing according to the rules. So... One of the things that is increasingly important, and you're seeing it in um, laws, modern laws around the world, is much stronger enforcement for um, those bad uh, actors who intentionally and maliciously uh, misuse personal data of, uh, of individuals. You have you know, strong uh, administrative penalties, strong enforcement uh, of fines and orders that, uh, binding orders that um, can be made to bring people in line. So, for example, you know, speaking of de-identification, you know, it's one thing to enable uh, a use of data in de-identified form for all the good reasons that Pam uh, so eloquently set out. And one of the sort of, you know, the, the other side of the coin is to make sure that there's a strong disincentive for people to try to re-identify information that was um, de-identified for a purpose. So increasingly, you're seeing prohibitions against re-identifying information that was intended to be de-identified. In fact, also attaching in some conditions uh, penalties, um, monetary penalties. Certainly, PHEPA envisages that, and uh, I think it's an important, you know, part of the uh, part of the rules. Uh, you you play hard, you work hard, but you also have to. Uh, play fair. So uh, I would say that that's part of the um, part of the equation as well for engendering uh, public trust. Thank you, Patricia. And I'm going to pass it over to Robin if she's got something to add to that as well. Robin? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, just make sure. I just want to pick up on the point when I said about, you know, individuals and I, I read about information, you automatically went to the terms of use and the policies that said nobody reads. And I think that's one of the biggest myths. That is the worst 
in my opinion, sometimes place to look. It's a legal obligation and they're generally written by lawyers in legal language that the average consumer probably doesn't read or can't understand. I look at the company and the culture and the way that they talk about privacy within the way they operate as a company. A good company who really believes in this stuff and I'm going to say TELUS does a pretty good job of doing it, so there you go, uh, Pam, is they put out videos, they talk about their experience, no different than the way they talk about their brand to the consumers, um, they make it part of that. That tells you a lot about the company and how they operate it or they're just doing it because there's a law behind there that says you shall do it. Um, and I think that's an important point when you're educating individuals and you think about the companies you're going to give your data to. Thanks, Robin, for adding that. And, you know, just uh, want to wrap up this discussion um, before we go to the audience Q&A is one over to Wendy. And she had mentioned that, you know, we really need to collaborate and get together. And I wonder from your perspective, Wendy, if we want to have support to that innovation and research side in healthcare, what and who do we need uh, to bring to the table to come together so that we can use health data appropriately, have the right controls in place, maybe even contribute and some suggestions to legislation? Who has to be at that table to discuss it in a pragmatic, useful way so that we can progress and advance healthcare without having data privacy and security stifle or slow us down? Um, thanks, Alan. Um, well, I think, uh, first of all, um, we tend to say privacy and security as if it's one word, and increasingly in this complex environment that we're working in, um, and being someone that uh, has worked on uh, in this field for quite a long time, security people will tell you they're not privacy experts, and privacy experts will tell you that they're not security experts. So I think, um, first of all, privacy and security should be part of that. Um, but clearly the regulators, and if we're talking about health data, patients should have a voice, healthcare practitioners should have a voice, researchers, um, people within the government, which are not necessarily always the regulators, but the Ministry of Health, and importantly, industry. I think one of the things that we have such an opportunity ahead of us with is that each one of those stakeholder groups brings something critically important to the whole puzzle together. And if we can bring everyone together to work through, you know, the researchers with their expertise, the regulators with their expertise, industry with their deep expertise of data management and analytics and being able to um, you know, look at the data and be able to use that predictive, um, the predictive tools that exist, patients so that we can really understand what is, what they want, what they expect. Um, that's how it's going to happen. And I can tell you, I've spoken at a number of public deliberations and patients are really interested in making sure that they are getting the, their practitioners have the most current data and that their data is being treated as personal, privately, but they really want to get and so I think we'd be surprised bringing everybody in the room how much of a fun role we all have. Thanks very much, Wendy. And with that, I'm going to bring it out to the audience uh, to take some audience questions. So there's the ability to type in your question into the chat box uh, that you've hopefully been doing already. And we will go to the questions and have a bit of a Q&A uh, directed to the panelists. If you have any particular question for one of the specific panelists, uh, please feel free to address them. And we'll certainly make sure we call them out and uh, answer your question. So with that, we'll move over to the audience Q&A. Thank you so much for that fascinating panel. We've got a lot of questions from our audience, as we suspected. So we'll turn it back to you, Alan, to take up the questions with the panel. Thank you for that. And uh, we've had a question from Jason, who put in his question quite early. And it's floated to the top as being one of the prioritized questions. So I'm going to go with that one first. So I think I'm going to ask uh, this one to Robin and Patricia, and maybe even Stephen can weigh in. But Jason has asked, with the significant introduction of artificial intelligence in healthcare today, what is the panel's stance on who is the custodian of that type of material and data handling when it's not necessarily human interacted? So I think that's uh, very applicable. 
Um, start off with you, Robin. What do you think since you're working in that AI space? So, Robin? Nope. The line of 2021, you're on mute. I'm starting that all over again. I finished the answer, you know, over to you, but that was where everyone can hear. Um, so I think it's a very interesting conversation. You certainly can't get away from a data ownership of where it starts in terms of the panel. There's definitely views about how it gets, you know, transformed within the artificial data and what comes out. And uh, so depending on the context, the type of machine learning, the type of algorithms that you're actually using will give you a different answer maybe in each particular time. So I would go back to saying, what is the context and where did it come from? And I look more about the protections and the ultimate use and looking at de-identification first before I would um, move into the machine language processing. It's part of the process. Thanks, Robin. And, and Patricia, who do you think owns that data that we might feed into you know, powering artificial intelligence? Because that's what it runs on, right? The better the data you have, better AI can run. Who's the custodian and who owns that? So uh, I have to say, uh, after all these years, the one question I really, really have trouble answering and I always <laughs> evade is who owns the data? <laughs> I try to uh, stay clear of that question. Um, and uh, so I'm going to skate around that one again tonight, today. But uh, uh, I do think that, to, of course, you know, the question is an excellent one. A lot of it will depend on the facts and uh, the specific data flows. But I do, uh, I would say, generally speaking, that uh, the, the, the modern data protection laws that have uh, provisions around automated processing more and more um, really zero in on this question of accountability and ensuring that there is an accountable entity that is responsible for the automated processing, for the decisions that are being made, for the algorithms that are being fed in, and that there be a human in the loop um, to take account uh, for uh, corrections, adjustments, and, uh, and to take responsibility when, when uh, individuals challenge that. So I think it's very, Excellent question from an engineering standpoint that I can't answer, uh, but I do know from a legal perspective that there is uh, increasingly this this accountability governance that is that has to be put around uh, many of these AI processes, and uh, I think that's the way um, uh, other laws will will follow. Um, anyway, that's my prediction. Thanks, Patricia. I know that from a regulatory and legal standpoint, you do have to be careful with that. So I'm going to go and uh, see what Stephen has to say. And then after that, maybe go over to Pam as well to see what their take is on that. And since they're not regulators and don't have to be too legal about it, you can speak a bit more pragmatically about the custodians of that AI data. Go ahead, Stephen. I mean, cer certainly in the uh, in the United States, I mean, it would fall to or the responsibility would so follow the organization that's collecting and using the data. So uh, regardless of whether they're putting it through some form of AI or machine learning or not, be that the the you know the hospital or the university that's that's taking this information or the the in our case the insurance provider. Um, so that, I mean that just because it's used in a different system would not absolve them in responsibility, and HIPAA would still, at least in our case, at least in the United States case, would still take effect. Okay, and what about for you, Pam? You've done uh, the mobility data that you have. Um, have you put it through any sort of AI or what's your take on uh, custodian and ownership of that AI data? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, and, and like Pat, I, I won't talk about ownership because I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the right question, but I, I understand the, que the, the question about custodianship and, and accountability. And I think if we, if we are developing, if, a, if an organization is developing AI that's generating data from personal information that would also be personally identifiable i you know as far as i'm concerned we remain accountable for that data and we have to treat it as personal information if it is in fact personally identifiable information so i for me it feels um it feels fairly clear if we are the ones uh, that are creating that der derived data from personal information uh everything that flows from that original personal information that we collected and for which we are the custodian 
um, we need to uh, ensure that we are responsible for. So whether there's a there's a AI service provider involved, um, that's it's still it's still with us if we're the ones that are responsible for putting that data through that that uh, AI. Okay, thanks, Pam. I've got a question from Elena uh, that's also floated to the top, and we've talked about this a little bit during the panel discussion around trust. And so she's got a question to clarify a little bit more on that. That is besides a pragmatic approach and dealing with data collected from thin air, it all falls to the issue of social trust. I believe the trust is disappearing. How do we plan to gain that trust or gain that trust back? So anyone want to take that one? And I'm going to pop over to Robin first and uh, Pam next, because I know Robin was talking about that trust factor. Oh, I keep getting loaded on the hard questions. I liked your answers better on the last one, accountability. I, you threw me there and I should have come back with that. But in terms of stress, uh, trust, I would say really, I look at, it, it is about the cultures of the company and we have good companies that have very good cultures and they're starting to talk about that and you see how they go with their behaviors and their attitudes. And it's not just on how they use data, it's how they treat, um, I would say their employees is how they treat their customers. It's how, you know, you take on initiatives for society and good and your corporate responsibility. So all of those pieces factor into a way that a large corporation manages itself. And when you see a company that manages itself in all aspects well, they probably intuitively will probably manage the data that it has um, in their hands properly and maybe from a customer focus, especially if they are a company who's extremely consumer focused. Um, you will do that because that leads to that trust factor and they're only going to stay with you if you continue to honor that. Uh, so that's one way if you want to look at the social good is that companies who have good cultures and trust, you will probably feel more comfortable in the processes that they're doing because they just take these things seriously. That's the way I'd look at it. Thanks, and Pam, you had something to add there. Yeah, I think it, I think it's a great question because I think that is probably the number one uh, challenge facing organizations um, of any type today when it comes to data. And, and Wendy did such a great job of of outlining why it matters um, that we are able to leverage data, that you know the amazing outcomes that can can come of it. Uh, but if we are in fact losing trust, and there are lots of indications that we are that we are we are in a bit of a, a trust crisis right now. Um, how do we, how do we as organizations deal with that? And I, I you know, m my only suggestion, uh, well, maybe not my only one, but I think the the primary thing we need to focus on is a much more transparency about what we are doing and figuring out a way uh, to explain what is happening, even though sometimes it's quite complex, uh, in a way that's meaningful. Um, and that doesn't mean explaining all the technology. It means uh, helping individuals understand the implications of sharing their data, how their data will be used, and how it could um, come back and impact them per personally or others. Uh, so I think we could all do way better uh, at transparency, and we and we need to. Uh, I think we also have to be aware of the fact that the reality is um, people like a, like a scary story. Uh, the media likes a scary story. Uh, so I think we have to figure out a way to, to counter some of that and get some of the great stories out there about um, organizations that are being responsible with data, that are doing great things with data, and how we have we all have some skin in the game to get this right, uh, not just to avoid the wrong. Thanks, Pam. And I'm just going to move on to the next question, so we can fit in as many as we can. Uh, there's a question from Sibylla, and uh, she starts off with thanking all the panelists. So thanks for that. I'm wondering if any of the panelists could speak to whether they see patients as having an interest in de-identified data. And I know that uh, during the panel discussion, Wendy was very clear that she's happy um, if her data and health data is used to kind of promote the better good and the better health of others. So I'm going to start off with you, Wendy, about your thoughts of people's interest in using de-identified data. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the, what the person means by interest, but I'll just talk more generally about de-identification. And I'm speaking about it not from a regulator's perspective, but more probably from an individual's perspective and really referencing back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, and that, you know, I'm happy for my, my data to be used. I'd like it to be de-identified um, because I would like 
our researchers and our practitioners to be able to use the data that they have about a person of my genetic makeup to be able to make better care decisions. And so, um, and I don't think most of the researchers actually really want to know who I am anyway. They're more interested in my genetic makeup than they are in my name or where I, they might care about where I live. But um, so I think I, I am making an assumption on what I'm interpreting that question to mean. Um, I think most patients would like their information de-identified. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that goes to the crux of this whole issue about personal privacy and health data is the fact that people want to keep their data private and, and they should be allowed to. Um, and, you know, I was actually hoping you were going to ask me the earlier question because, um, you know, that does go back to the question about trust and, um, you know, everybody had some great answers about, but, you know, as I was listening to the keynote this morning, who was going down the path of abuse of power and systems in place to um, ensure that we don't have the abuse of power, it really had me leading to thinking about other industries and other topics where we have systemically brought in systems and processes that create public trust. You know, whether it's in you're getting a building inspection and so they have to be certified and there's a body that comes over and if you have somebody that hasn't been doing that. And it it really started to make, if you, if you went down that path about abuse of power, but also we also wanna hear all the great stories, but we also do wanna hear like was announced yesterday that there's an interpretation that something was being done that shouldn't have been done. And our leadership came out and said, this is not allowed and this needs to be stopped. And so I, I do think that going back to not putting Patricia on the spot, one of our challenges of course, is that this data is flowing across borders. I mean, forget about Canada, it's flowing you know, across provincial borders, it's, it's flowing flowing across global borders. And we don't have a structure in place today that actually brings that all together to be able to say, do we all agree that one particular activity is an abuse of power? Do we all agree that something happened that it shouldn't? So it really does put us into the position that in order to build trust, we need to educate, we need transparency, but we also need to align on what are the rules of the game. Right. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. We are at time, so we are going to wrap this up. And I want to thank the panel for doing a great job. Always great to work with such a knowledgeable and expert panel. I'm going to pass it back over to Dave uh, to wrap us up. 